Hi, my name is Monica Yurick and I am a behavioral consultant with Bretonovian Associates. In this video, we are going to be talking about the importance of assessing client preference as a measure for social validity. Let's start by talking through a few scenarios. Have you ever developed a flawless treatment but can't get caregivers on board? Or a plan that eliminated problem behavior but was incredibly complicated to run? How about a plan that was effective and made caregivers happy, but your learner wasn't? Wow, really good job! Trace! Oh my goodness, look, you got your last token! You get an m, &M. Some might think, why does this even matter? If my treatment is effective, then it is in the best interest of my client, right? Well, yes, but not exactly. When creating behavior plans, it's really important to assess client preference and to take preference into consideration, especially if two or more treatments are equally effective. This ensures that caregivers are going to follow the plan and that your clients are happy as well. In a field that stresses objectivity, um, taking into consideration feelings might be hard for some clinicians to wrap their heads around. In fact, our forefather, Montrose Wolf, said, subjective criteria have not been very respectable in our field. But it is possible to be great scientists and great clinicians, all while keeping families and clients' um, considerations and feelings in mind. A simple way to assess social validity is through questionnaires or interviews. These can be formal or informal. We want to make sure to keep open communications with caregivers. We want to make sure that our caregivers are involved and that we check in with the caregivers often and make sure that they're happy. We also want to make sure that we're developing plans and treatment components that caregivers are actually able to run. You can also assess social validity formally through questionnaires or surveys. These can be open-ended, multiple choice, or rating scales. There are pre-made questionnaires available online, or you can feel free to create your own. For a review of social validity assessments, see Schwartz and Bear, 1991. When you're creating a questionnaire to assess social validity, Wolf in 1978 suggested that we evaluate the following. The social significance of the goals, or are the specific behavioral goals really what society wants? The social appropriateness of the procedures, or do the ends justify the means, that is, do the participants, caregivers, other consumers consider the treatment procedures acceptable? And three, the social importance of the effects, that is, are the consumers satisfied with the results, all the results, including any unpredicted ones? Assessing caregiver preference is awesome and something that we should definitely do. But what about our learners' preferences? There are some times our learners are able to let us know what they like. We might be able to give them a questionnaire to ask them informally, which procedure do you like better? But with a lot of our learners with intellectual developmental disabilities, or autism, um, they're not able to vocally tell us which procedures they like best. So in this case, what do we do to make sure that we're taking their feelings and their preferences into consideration when we're developing a behavior plan? In 2010, Greg Hanley introduced a way to assess client preference when our clients are not able to vocally tell us which procedures they like best, and this is through the use of a concurrence change procedure. So let's check out what a concurrent change procedure would look like. First, the learner is exposed to each condition, which is associated with a different discriminative stimulus for multiple sessions. In this example, we are going to use different colored token boards and color cards. Trace the square. In condition one, the learner starts with five tokens and loses tokens for engaging in problem behavior. Awesome job. Trace the circle. You lose a token. In condition two, the learner starts with zero tokens and earns a token for not engaging in problem wow. behavior. In the control condition, no treatment is in place. After exposing the learner to multiple sessions of each condition, it is time to conduct the preference assessment. Place the color cards in front of the learner. These stimuli are called initial links. 
allow the learner to select the color and experience the condition associated. Continue the preference assessment until he or she reliably selects one. How would you like to work? Pick one. In the past, when I've conducted Great. concurrent change procedures, I kept going until my learner chose three of the same initial links in a row, or until 10 sessions passed, whichever came first. The condition selected most frequently is then assumed to be the preferred choice. So the point is, is when we're developing behavior plans, we need to take client preference into consideration. That is for both the caregivers and the clients themselves. ABA isn't just a bag of tricks. We have to be flexible, and the difference between a good clinician and an average clinician is one that is able to make treatments that are able to be run with the family and that the family likes. Assessing preference can mean the difference between a family disliking ABA or talking poorly about ABA and a family that feels like ABA actually works for them and they're able to do it. After all, the only thing that caregivers want more than seeing their children or their students successful is seeing them happy. Thanks for watching.